And joining us now in New York, New York, Ann Kramer. She's author of It's Always Personal, Emotions in the New Workplace. Ann, it's good to have you on the program tonight. How are you? Hi, terrific. Thank you. Excellent. Well, uh, this, I can't pretend this is an original first question, but it always gets us off to a good start. Why'd you write this book? <laughs> Well, a friend of mine asked me a question at a cocktail party a couple years ago. She said, why is it that every woman she knew had cried at work and wished that she had not? And I thought, huh, interesting question because I was one of those women. So that innocent question set me off on a two-year journey across the country to explore what were the prejudices that surrounded emotion in the workplace. Can you tell us the story of the day when you were running Nickelodeon and Sumner Redstone, your chairman, phoned you up and you remember that phone call, I don't know, how many years has it been? 15 years since that call was made? Long time, yes. <laughs> Tell us the story. Well, I was celebrating in my office. I actually wasn't running the network, but I was running a division of the network and uh, had just done one of the largest deals in history with Sony Music to distribute our video and uh, audio product. And I was in my office celebrating with a group of friends, and um, the phone rings, and my assistant said, oh, it's Sumner on line one. I'm like, oh, awesome. You know, the big boss called to congratulate me. How fabulous is this? And then I picked up the phone gaily, expecting, you know, you know, platitudes. And instead, he just ripped into me because I'd failed to make the Viacom stock price move. And <laughs> mind you, I was within a division, within a division, within a division, within a division of the parent company. So the expectation for me to have been able to make the price move was completely ludicrous, but I felt powerless to sort of express any anger back with him. That would have been professional suicide, so I just sort of sat there and took it, and when he slammed the phone down, I burst into tears, which is kind of a normal thing for what women do. Do you know why you burst into tears in the workplace, which of course I'm sure you knew was a taboo thing to do? Well, yes, although I know now, I didn't know at the time, now I know that this is actually a very common phenomenon among women, um, that because they tend to be in positions that are junior to men in the workplace, uh, lots of times, 60%, in fact, of the women that I interviewed were angry, uh, expressed anger during the course of the past year and felt that they can't express it. So when they can't express it, the emotion has to come out in some context, and in that this more socially acceptable norm is to cry. And then there's this kind of vicious cycle where um, you feel ashamed that you've cried, you feel angry that you weren't able to express your anger, and then you sort of feel like it's just this emotional stew um, that is not helpful to anyone. Did your colleagues see you cry when you did? Yes, they did see me cry. And that was one of the things that was the most disturbing to me because, you know, I was their leader and I felt like, I had to, you know, everybody had spent just months and months and months, night and day, working on getting this deal together. And so I didn't want to sort of undermine their hard work doing this because it was a great opportunity for the company. But I also didn't want, I, you know, crying is one of the hardest emotions in, that we have uh, to suppress. Once it sort of starts bubbling up, very few people can stop at least at coming out in a little bit of a context. And so I just sat there and I kind of turned to them all and said, you know, ho, ho, you know, job well done and, you know, we're all exhausted, let's go home. Did you feel any need to kind of apologize for letting your guard down that way? Which, which you know, again, you, you, as a leader, you would not want to have done. No. I, I, it was a particularly complicated, complicated situation for me because, in fact, I didn't want to let them know that the big boss, in fact, had been sort of kind of uh, so upset about this because it was this great, wonderful thing that we'd done. So it was much more complicated than feeling like I was letting them down or sort of feeling bad myself. I kind of wanted to immediately stop it so I could kind of continue to let them feel like they'd done a really good job. Um, mm. So my, my situation was different from others in that context. We'd gone from the highest of highs to kind of I went then to the lowest of lows in, you know, 10 seconds flat. Now, of course, he hung up on you, so he, he doesn't know he made you cry, but now you've written this book and you've done a lot of interviews on it. Does he know yet? Well, I tried to interview him for the book. I went back and did a kind of 360-degree um, process uh, when I was writing the book of all my former colleagues to kind of see if any of them had remembered or what they sort of had felt about it. And needless to say, he wasn't keen to um, have me interview him. I assume he knows about it now. But the fact of the matter is, is that he is a personality type um, that expressed anger often, and I just wasn't particularly aware of that at the time. Gotcha. Okay, let's broaden the discussion to compare today to the mm -hmm. workplace of, uh, let's say, the television show Mad Men. How have the rules right. about how much emotion, let's say women, can show in mm -hmm. that workplace changed over the intervening whatever it is, 40, 50 years. 
Yeah, I, I in fact don't think that the emotions in the workplace have changed that much for women. I think we're at this very interesting dynamic uh, moment in time right now, particularly in American culture where for the first time in history, we, women are now over 50% of the workforce, in large part because so many of the people who were laid off during the recession were in the kind of traditionally male-dominated manufacturing fields. And so uh, I think that we're actually at that kind of rare moment 40 years in where there's an opportunity for women to actually begin to embrace more of their kind of characteristically kind of empathetic, compassionate sort of side. Um, when women went to work in the 60s in significant numbers, uh, to be equal at that point in time meant to act like men who were the dominant force. And that, um, I believe, created a high degree of emotion labor for people. What would be the positive uh, effects of allowing people? Uh, the rules would say it's okay to cry in the workplace. What's the positive spinoff from that? Well, there's a lot of positive effect. There's been one of the other things I did in the book was I interviewed and looked at all the kind of current research in terms of neuroscience. And this is another sort of uh, crossover point that's very new, sort of really in the 2000s that people have been able to use fMRIs and really study working brains. And so, you know, I think uh, we're finding out that uh, through studies that have been done that, for instance, if you lower stress levels, if you lower anxiety levels, it allows people to sort of access greater creativity. It sort of is a prod to innovation. Um, if you allow people to kind of embrace more of their kind of true emotional selves, you find that there's less absenteeism among the staff. Um, emotions are, they're now believing, are almost like um, a virus or something, that they are actually kind of contagious and they ripple out. So if you're living in a kind of toxic work environment, that can lead to very demotivating um, behavior on the part of your work, on you know, the workforce. And if, if you're in a positive environment, it can lead to really, um, you know, just breakthrough ideas that can come out in any sort of numerous ways. Well, I suspect the experts would say these are two very different kind of management techniques that you've described here. The, the kind of mm -hmm. making it a wonderful place to work and where the emotions are allowed to show versus the kind of management which I suspect is typically more male oriented, which is keep everybody sort of off balance, uh, make them fear for their jobs, let them know that if they don't hit their marks, uh, you know, they're out of here. How do you know the former is better than the latter? Well, I don't think you necessarily do. I mean, there are obviously environments where the kind of command and control chain of command, you know, the military, for instance, I don't think you could actually sort of have a kind of, you know, group think around different sort of strategies. I think you have to deal with things that are appropriate to each environment. Um, but w one of the things that I think is um, kind of uh, relevatory for people in this new age is that we haven't ever sort of viewed emotion as a positive asset in the workplace. And I think the science and the reporting that I did from people, I did a gigantic survey with um, J. Walter Thompson, over 2,000 people nationwide in two different sort of batches. And 88% of all people that we interviewed said that they wanted more emotion in the workplace. Now, that doesn't mean anger, and it doesn't mean crying necessarily. What it does mean is um, an act, for people to be able to access more of themselves across both their work and home life, I think, on a consistent basis. Um, and the, and one the, of the really, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, the, the thinking being that if you are allowed to access more of your emotions, you'll be a more productive employee? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that the fiction of the workplace being um, a place where you take only irrational behavior, that everything's about kind of return on investment and, you know, uh, flow charts and, you know, organizational charts is really a myth that has been sort of propagated down the line from the Industrial Revolution time and, frankly, even goes back to kind of Plato in the early days of reason being the thing that makes man man and that emotions lead us down a, you know, negative pathway. But the reality of it is, is that, um, you know, we're discovering that you cannot separate emotion from any decision that you make. Um, there's a neuroscientist at uh, USC in California named Antonio Damasio who's done a lot of work in this area. And from every single, um, you know, what you have for lunch to, you know, how you choose to address uh, uh, contemporary in a meeting, emotion is behind all of that. They're inextricably linked. Mm. And I think even beyond that, we now live in an environment where um, I don't know a single person who isn't sitting at home, um, you know, getting emails lobbying in from colleagues at work, both at nighttime and on the weekends, 
And when you're at the office, uh, you know, your kids are texting you, finding out information, your partners are texting you, this and that. I mean, there is no distinction in the current uh, sort of working arena between work life and home life. And I think it's time to kind of get clear about that and develop protocols and ways to manage it that help everybody navigate those completely new waters. Let's talk about some of the science here. And I must say, in, in the 100th uh, year of his birth coming up this summer, we do love to quote Canada's own Marshall McLuhan. So here we go. <laughs> Our age of anxiety, he said, is in great part the result of trying to do today's job with yesterday's tools and yesterday's concepts. And I wonder whether the science of today backs up uh, Professor McLuhan's 44-year-old insight. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and on m multiple levels. I mean, first off, 75% of the people I interviewed confess to being anxious. Um, you know, the National Institutes of Health report that 44 million Americans are on some kind of like anxiety uh, treatment of some sort. So this is a huge issue. And I think it, a lot of it is because, you know, we all feel kind of like the deer in headlights. Uh, we can see the change trundling down, you know, the, the road at us, but we really have no idea how to respond to it. And the science of anxiety, it was one of our early emotions developed in the amygdala, the kind of most primitive parts of our brains that was our kind of early warning system. You know, our ancestors on the savanna, like the stillness that you might sense in an afternoon could be everybody's taking a break or it could be that everybody got very quiet because of predators in the, in the midst. Well, today we feel that anxiety from cognitive issues. So it's, you know, is that colleague really trying to stab me in the back or what's going on? Or gosh, I don't feel like I can navigate, you know, the Twitter universe, let alone, you know, figure out how to, uh, you know, get my spreadsheets done overnight. And nobody feels prepared. Nobody knows how to cope. The incoming data is overwhelming. And I think we are a culture, uh, as, you're, as McLuhan said, where we are all kind of freaking out about how to handle um, what's coming at us, and we really just don't know how to identify it or address it. I had a hunch you'd like the McLuhan quote, and I got a hunch you're not going to like this one. <laughs> Let me try this anyway. This is Angie Morgan and Courtney Lynch from something called Leading from the Front, No Excuse Leadership Tactics for Women. Mm. You know of it. Right. Okay, here we go. Tears chip away at your command presence or your ability to inspire confidence in others through your demeanor. They create a perception of weakness. When women lose control of their emotions, this often suggests to their team that they have lost control of the situation. Your reaction? Oh, well, uh, the multiple levels here again. On the purely scientific side, I found things that I had had no knowledge about at all. For instance, women's tear ducts are anatomically different from male tear ducts. Our tear ducts are actually smaller, which means that when we cry, tears tend to sort of spew forth and male tear ducts are larger so that a man might be feeling the exact same degree of emotion, but get only, you know, wells up a little bit as opposed to actually has tears streaming down his face. So that's got nothing Women to do with produce, macho, that's biology. That's biology, but see, part of one of the things that I try to stress in my book is that we need to kind of understand the biology and how it interfaces with the macho piece. And so, you know, I, in my survey, I, in my research, I discovered that um, there were two things that just I found completely counterintuitive to my assumptions going in. The first is, is that people at all levels of management reported that they had cried at work during the last year, men and women, so that the concept that the authors that you just alluded to were uh, suggesting that, you know, women are weak and they won't sort of, you know, make it into top management if they cry is absolutely, I think, specious based on the results of what I found in my research. The second piece is that um, people who reported that they had cried at work were also not at all unhappy. It was this kind of one-time incident that um, people would have happened to them and that they sort of looked at and it's like time to move on. What was really interesting, though, from my survey is that women who saw other women um, cry at work um, thought of them as being shameful, um, thought of them as being almost like uh, showing a moral failing, whereas men who saw women cry at work thought, oh, well, you know, it's just something that happens every once in a while, not a big deal. Hmm. The men who cried at work reported that they felt cleansed and refreshed and like they could tackle their problems in a kind of new and wonderful way. The women who uh, reported that they had cried at work felt the exact opposite. It was that back to that cycle almost that I was describing at the very beginning where women kind of want to express one emotion, can't, they end up crying and they feel terrible about it. And I think a lot of this is because we simply don't understand how our emotions operate in the 21st century. 
It's always personal. Emotions in the new workplace. Ann Kramer, it's really good of you to come on TVO tonight and talk to us about it. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Great conversation.